This is becoming, this is getting to be calamitous. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to lose my audience here if we... <laughs> yeah, you can't. You're locked in. <laughs> we do have some complimentary water in the lobby. Oh, here we go, here we go. Welcome to the Longmont Museum, a center for culture in northern Colorado where people of all ages explore history, experience art, and discover new ideas through dynamic programs, exhibitions, and events. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum, Stewart Auditorium, and we are coming at you live and direct and a little bit late via, uh, the, via the magic of the worldwide internet, and we're coming at you live from the Stewart Auditorium. I'd like to thank all of those who make our programming possible. The Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, otherwise known as SCFD, the Stewart Family Foundation, the Friends of the Longmont Museum, and our many museum donors and members. We simply couldn't do all that we do without you, so thank you. For more information about all that we do here or to find out about how you can support the museum's work, visit longmontmuseum.org. Tonight is the last Thursday night, uh, last of our Thursday nights at the museum programming uh, for the spring of 2021. Um, we'll be picking back up with our uh, summer concert series, that, which will be kicking off uh, June 17th right here in the museum's courtyard. And we will be having, inviting a live audience to join us. So check out our website for that. Uh, we'll be kicking off the concert series, like I said, on June 17th with um, the Tierra Band with Bridget Law. Bridget, of course, is one of the founding members of Elephant Revival. They're also neighbors and uh, big fans of the museum, so we're really glad to have them. Uh, for more information on our concert series, visit our website. Concert series, visit our website. Um, we are hoping that when we do come back to this kind of programming, uh, our Thursday night programming in the fall, uh, that we'll have actual people in the auditorium. So this could be the last of our kind of COVID live stream programs. We're excited about that because we love you out there on the internet and Facebook and cable and stuff, but we'd, all, we'd really rather have you here with us in person. So we're, we're excited about that. Tonight we have a really exciting program, one that I've been looking forward to for some time. Um, we're gonna be celebrating the publication of this book. Please don't mind the post-its. It does, yours won't come with post-its. <laughs> it is, of course, uh, Stories of Our Longmont Parks. And we have the author with us this evening, Paula Fitzgerald. I wanna, uh, first of all, congratulate you, Paula, on a gorgeous book. Thank it's, you. Thank you're you. welcome. It's, it's really amazing what you can learn about, uh, learn about a city from telling the story of its parks, I think. Um, and when I, you know, honestly, when I think of public parks, I, I kind of think boredom. And, and, and I have to say that because growing up in the suburbs as a teenager in the 80s, adolescents, you know, would go to parks to, you know, drink in the middle of the night and get in trouble, <laughs> basically. And that's, that's where we, we turn to public parks as, as bored teenagers. So it's probably a hangover, kind of literally, from then. But, the, you know, this book, there's just nothing boring about this book. It's, it's really kind of more of a page turner. And if you read it straight through, there's this feeling of unexpectedly popping up in different neighborhood and community parks around town. This book is a bit of a time machine, I, I think, that takes you on a whirlwind tour of Longmont, surprising you with unexpected stories along the way and leaving you with a sense of the history of this place that's really quite charming. It's a must for any Longmonsters bookshelf or coffee table, and the book can be purchased through the museum's website, Barbed Wire Books, I mm -hmm. believe, and which of course is our local independent bookstore on Main Street and where you should be buying your books. Um, and anywhere else? And the Used Book Emporium. On oh, and Main of course Street the Used well. Book Emporium yeah. too. Yeah. One of another fine purveyor of mm -hmm. printed matter here in Longmont. Anyway, tell us a little bit about you, 
uh, Paula. You were born and raised in Colorado, right? That's right, yeah. Um, one of the few natives um, that exist in this state. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, But you were really born in California, right? <laughs> right? No, I was born in, in uh, Denver and raised in Golden and pretty much have stayed my whole life on the Northern Front Range. Um, spent a couple of years at CU in, in English um, and then went on to landscape architecture up at CSU where I got my degree, yeah. Uh, I did 13 years of private practice as a consultant, uh, mostly in Boulder area, and then um, came to the city of Longmont in 1994 and worked mm. a little over 20 years uh, as project manager for new park and trail development. 20 years. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what landscape architecture is? What is sure. landscape architecture? Sure, well, landscape architecture is, in my view, the best profession around. You would say that. <laughs> I would say that, I, yes. I thought managing an auditorium was actually the best, <laughs> but you know. Basically, it's design of the exterior environment. So anything outside of a building wall is generally, although now it's kind of worked in with some interior spaces as well, but. Generally, it's outside the building walls. And typically, anything from gardens to parks to trails, um, even siding nuclear power plants, it falls under the genre of landscape architecture, believe it or not. So if there's young people out there looking for a career choice, I would highly recommend looking at it. It's, it's been a fabulous career for me. Mm -hmm. And it's big picture designy stuff. It's, 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 you're sort of curating curating what goes into a park, basically. Correct, yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, everything, as my job um, evolved, it was everything from buying the land to running engineering studies on them, uh, holding public process with the community for um, what people envisioned in those parks, and then overseeing the design and construction as well. So, And then I'd hand it off to operations to take care of. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fun. That's fun. To dream the dream and then That's right. there you go. Make it make it real. Um, but that must be so super satisfying to see it to see something take shape like that. I think there's nothing better than seeing public spaces um, and people out and enjoying them for a real satisfying uh, end result of of lots of years of hard work to put it together. So yeah, it was great. When you were a young landscape architect, fresh out of school, was this? Did you did you imagine doing something like this, working for a municipality and kind of overseeing, a, a, basically, a, a, the 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 park system or the yeah. Yeah, kind well, of. actually, I started more in the horticultural background, so okay. I really saw myself as more of a garden designer at first, mm -hmm. and you know that got very limiting pretty quickly. So um, then went to work for a couple private consulting companies and did a whole variety of work. But, but once I did some public municipal parks, um, I was hooked. Yeah, so I started looking for opportunities. And so this, this book really kind of documents, um, this is kind of your, your life for 20 years, right? That's correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and many other people's lives as well. I mean, there's... Um, this is 150 years of uh, Longmont's park development. Um, I only had a little over 20 years of that, so extensive work from the very beginning of Longmont's founding, and even before, when they sat around Farwell Hall in Chicago and envisioned this colony. Um, that was, that was, parks were a big part of that. Yeah. Well, how would you describe the importance of of parks to the life of a city? You know, I think parks are critical. I think they're as much critical infrastructure as anything. I mean, certainly streets and sewer lines and, and um, businesses and homes are, are obviously important. But, you know, if anyone talks about quality of life benchmarks or best of city um, awards, things like that, polls of what makes a community, Parks and trails and open spaces, um, that's what really generates the enthusiasm for a community. It's the places where we collect, we gather, we meet, we, we make memories in those spaces. 
So I just think they're of utmost importance. And I think it's too bad that often they're overlooked in budgeting. Um, you know, parks uh, development always has to really wrestle with fire and public safety and things like that, and not to diminish the importance of their work, but but I think you know park, parks are where people really um, find their joy, they find their satisfaction, they interact with nature, um, get exercise. I mean, there's just so many beneficial things, health, mental health, physical mm -hmm, health, mm -hmm. that come from those public spaces. And I think the, the original founders the, of the Chicago colony, those Chicagoans, those Midwesterners, uh, felt similarly because they had parks included, right. like you mentioned, in the original plans for the colony. Yeah, it was quite a lot for, you know, they only had a few thousand people to begin with. And to have three parks um, already envisioned and to actually construct, uh, work on constructing those parks the very first year when they're, they're trying to build their own homes and set up businesses and, you know, make their way in the world, that is really a testament to how much they revered those parks and felt that they were an important part of the, the community. And your book, your, the, the structure of your book is chronological. Correct. Where you tell the story of these parks beginning with the first parks. Mm -hmm. And the first section of your book is organized, well, it's organized into three sections. Correct. Yeah. And the first section is the, is the Romantic era, I think. Right, right, yeah. I decided to try to break the book into sections because I see them as three pretty distinct periods. And I wanted to give some context to um, how people, you know, the things that were happening in the world at that time. So that very first era, the Romantic era, as I've called it, you know, it was influenced by Thoreau and Emerson, by the explorers coming, uh, Stephen Long coming and discovering Long's Peak. John um, Muir, right, wasn't he? I'm sorry? John Muir. John Muir, yeah, yeah right. that was around the same time. So it was really an idealistic time, lots of exploration, um, a lot of philosophy, mm -hmm. a real push to um, find solace in nature. Uh, if you keep in mind that the cities back then were really blighted. There's lots of pollution. There was um, sweatshops everywhere. Um, Central Park, one of the original uh, objectives of de designing that park was to give people um, a green space, place for fresh air and exercise without lifting the bottle, as one, one uh, person described it. <laughs> so, um, you know, they were, they were viewed as a way to re bring some health into the community. Right, and those early settlers here, of, of the, the early colonists here in, in Longmont uh, were, were temperance people, right? They Correct, were, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and I'm sure they'd probably be rolling over in their graves to see all the distilleries and brew pubs we have right now, because it definitely was a temperance colony, and you could even lose your colony membership if you were uh, found with drink in your home. Um, Take a walk in the park, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you know, before you grab that, before you grab that beer out of the fridge. That's hey, right. why not think about taking a walk in a park? Take a stroll down uh, Oligarch Ditch, Oligarchy Ditch or something. Yeah. Anyway, um, so let's, let's jump into the book, shall okay. we? So sure. you start off with the first three parks. Yeah, you bet. Um, so the first three parks, um, the one I'll start with is Collier Park. Can we bring up those slides? Yeah. So this is the cover of the book, and this is a beautiful photograph that a local uh, photographer, Gerald Bruker, um, took of Lou Miller Park. Um, but we'll progress on. It doesn't seem to be progressing. Um, maybe, oh, there we go. So Collier Park, and a lot of people don't know who was Collier. Collier was a reverend, Robert Collier. And he was quite the force. Um, he emigrated from England in 1840 to the United States, so he was still a young man. He'd grown up in a um, very poor family, went to work at a young age, I think he was eight or nine, and he went to work in a cotton mill. And then he went on to apprentice as a blacksmith. Um, back in 1833, they passed the Factory Act, which was for Collier, 
hugely important because it, it limited um, working hours for children to a mere 48 hours a week, oh. which is a whole lot better than the 76 hours a week that he'd been become accustomed to. And it also required that they get education. So he'd only had third grade education, which was considered a lot at that time. Um, but he was also a really avid reader, so he went on and he spent lots of his uh, spare time, if there was any, reading books and, and uh, uh, wandering the fields and things. So um, anyway, he, he went on when he was a young man. He got married. Uh, they had a child. But then in one year, he lost his wife um, mm -hmm. during childbirth and his second child, his daughter. Um, he lost his father, a stepson, and the man he apprenticed under. So mm -hmm. if you can imagine the devastation of this, this young man, um, you know, feeling all the pain of all that loss, he went to a revival meeting that the Methodist Church was holding, and he felt a call to become a preacher. So he did that for a couple years. A couple years later, he remarried, and they set sail for America. Um, but he was a vocal abolitionist. In other words, he was strongly against slavery. So, and that's something that the Methodists at that time did not support. So he left that church and joined the Unitarian Church, ultimately became the reverend of the first Unitarian Church of Chicago. Mm. And he, he was a force. He drew um, people to his church from near and far. Um, so he was, he was an idealist, I'd say. Um, and so when this group was put together to envision a, Colorado, a Chicago, Colorado colony, he became its first president. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, when they were first talking about Longmont and didn't have the name Longmont then, Collier Colony was one of the names that was suggested. So he was a, a real big part of this community. You know, he never came here, never lived here, but d didn't even come here. And likely that's because in 1871, we had the Great Chicago Fire. And so he spent his energies trying to rebuild Chicago at that point. Sure. Um, let's see if I can get beyond. Okay, so Collier Park, as I mentioned before, this isn't progressing again. Um, there we go. Is one of the three parks shown on this plat, which is the original plat for the colony. Uh, so this was from 1871. So Collier, Thompson, and uh, Lake Park, as Roosevelt Park was called back in those days, are all shown on this plat. So again, that, that was a real big commitment um, for this young community. Um, Collier Park had um, a couple of things interesting. Both Collier and Thompson Park, the women of, well, they planted trees that very first year, and the women of Longmont carried buckets of water from the St. Ring Creek up to water them for a couple years to get them established. I think that's a very cool story. Um, and Collier on this map is sort of uh, upper right corner, that crisscrossy square. That's correct, right. okay. yep. Um, trying to progress again. Oh, there, there we go. go. Okay, so this, um, both Thompson and, and Collier Parks had bandstands built, and that was a great big community activity, very popular. People would bring their picnic baskets and listen to the concerts. This is the Longmont Coronet Band, and they were one of the very popular groups to play here. They made their claim to fame in 1871 by climbing Long's Peak and conducting a concert at the top. <laughs> so that was a really fun thing uh, that I came across. Also at Collier Park, our very first Arbor Day was held there. So yeah, so that's Collier Park. Um, progress on to Thompson Park, um, and this one was also built in 1871, and it's named for this woman, Elizabeth Thompson. Uh, she was a philanthropist, um, and she was very committed to giving people who were down on their luck a second chance. So she purchased 20 colony memberships and gave them to people who wanted to start a new life. 
Um, she also purchased the land for the park and another parcel for the first library, which was called Library Hall. And perhaps we, the first library in Colorado, right? Yes, that's right. And it was, uh, the library also served as um, the first school until the, uh, uh, until the Franklin School, or what's now known as Central Elementary School, was built. And that library building, I think it's still standing. Correct. Right? It's on Eric Mason's uh, mm -hmm. history, historic West Side history tour. Right, Please. yeah. But Miss Thompson didn't start out wealthy. She was also born into a very poor family. There was not a lot of money back then. Um, at nine years old, she was hired out as a house servant for 25 cents a week. Woohoo! <laughs> she also had very little formal education, but she was very smart and very inquisitive. At age 22, she um, took a trip to Boston where she met Thomas Thompson, who was 20 years her senior and um, an heir to a large fortune, very eccentric man apparently. So he was an art collector, a Harvard graduate, um, so very impressive fellow for this young woman. Um, so they quickly fell in love and married very quickly within weeks of their meeting. Um, in their life together, they supported um, arts and political causes. After Thomas died, um, 24 years after they were married, Elizabeth continued her philanthropy for things like yellow fever research and child widows in India. Um, and she, like Collier, was also a strong abolitionist um, and gave over a million dollars to anti-slavery causes. And she was a big supporter of a temperance colony. She also never lived in Longmont, but she did visit for the first strawberry festival, which she financed. Um, and beyond the concerts that both of these parks held, Thompson was also used, let's go to the slides again, um, to bed down the troops. Here, here is 1899, right. uh, 1898 and the Spanish-American War troops. So they, they um, marched down Main Street and went into Thompson Park and spent the night there and then continued on to Wyoming for their training. Um, Longmont's festivals started beyond the Strawberry Festival. Um, the first Pumpkin Pie Days was held at Thompson Park. And look at that crowd there. Uh, one year, over 10,000 people came from near and far. <clears throat> they liked the free coffee, the sandwiches, and the free pumpkin pies that the women of Longmont all cooked for them. And we're still kind of observing the pumpkin pie days yeah. at the Boulder County Fairgrounds. Right, right in, the, in the pre-COVID times. In yes, the pre-COVID times, Hopefully, times, hopefully right. that will come back. Um, Pumpkin Pie Days became so big that it had to move out of Thompson Park and into Roosevelt Park in 1915. Um, but today, Thompson Park is also well known for its tree walk, and I have to give a shout out to our fairly newly retired city forester, Ken Wickland, who was with us for numerous years. That was his idea. And if you see little tags, little plastic tags on the trees with numbers, they identify the various species of trees, and he wanted to give people a chance to see those trees in their different forms as they mature, so. How many different trees are planted there, do you, you know? No, you would ask me that, I, I don't know. A okay. lot, a lot. Is, is it in the book? No. No, okay. You have to ask Ken. Or you'll be able to be in the next book, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Be in Ken's book. <laughs> So you want me to go on to the next park? Yeah, I think the next park is, uh, it's, is it, it's Lake Park. No, it's Longmont Driving Park. No, it's, it's Roosevelt <laughs> it's, Park. What is it? Yeah. yeah. So, so this park has, um, you know, besides an incredibly rich history. Well, you it, know, actually, before we, before we move on there, I just want to say it's, it's really fascinating to me that the first two parks or the first, uh, the two most prominent people that we've discussed so far were hardcore abolitionists. Yes. And I, I just think, I, I, I love that the, the spirit of Longmont was, was based in that. I do that too. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm heartened by that. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm in a good place. We're in a good place. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Anyway, yes, Lake Park. <laughs> So yeah, Roosevelt Park, um, as we currently know it, has, uh, its claim to fame is it has had 
more name changes and revisions to that park than any of our other parks. It started out as Lake Park. Whoops. There we go. There's a, the only picture we have of Lake Park that I was able to find. So it's a little sketch that somebody drew up back in the day. It looks like an anatomical drawing. It looks like it could be my, my lungs <laughs> or my heart or my stomach the, yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. Um, so Lake Park was named for the Chicago colonists Deer Lake, Michigan. So as soon as they got here in 1871, they dug out the ground for the, for the basin for the lake and then it filled naturally with groundwater and ditch seepage. Um, and one interesting thing about the park at that time was that it, even though it was a public park, it was privately owned for 21 years. Uh, J.M. Mumford was uh, on the executive council of the Chicago, Colorado colony. And he bought, when he came in 1871 with the other colonists, he bought it at a tax sale for $2.48. But he held on to it for 21 years, and then finally in 1892, he deeded the site to the city of Longmont for, with the specification that it be used for recreational and sporting events. Um, but anyway, back to Lake Park, as it was only five years in existence, and people started grumbling. It was, you know, best for mosquito swapping, slapping, as they said. It, you know, it was a swampy bowl and a, a source of constant irritation to the residents. So they formed a committee to figure out what they're going to do with this park. And the committee came up with this idea to build a racetrack or a driving track around the perimeter. Naturally. Yeah, uh, naturally, yeah. 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 So support was pretty mixed for that. But nonetheless, uh, within, within a couple years, Longmont Driving Park was born. And... Um, Let's see if I can get the next picture up here. Um, oh, there we go. Oh. Oops. Go back. There we there go. We go. Ah, yeah. yeah. So for around 16 years, the park held this name, and it became one of the premier parks in northern Colorado. And the racetrack was well known. Um, people came from far and wide to come here for horse racing, bicycle racing, foot races. Um, and then after the automobile became widely available, they even had auto racing here. Um, and then the final name change uh, was to Roosevelt Park. And here's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt in 1900. He came to Longmont on a whistle-stop tour um, while campaigning for vice president on the McKinley ticket. Well, Roosevelt served most of two terms as president after McKinley was assassinated in 1901. Um, so to this day, he remains the youngest man to serve as president. And these entry gates, which you can see in this picture, kind of off to the right there, um, they still exist today, um, were built as after a community fundraiser and to honor this president sometime after 1910. Some of the other facilities built at the park at this time included the, uh, an auditorium uh, which was later known as Jitney Hall. Let's see if I can get that. Yeah, there's a better picture of the auditorium. And look at all the cars around there. It was some big Well, I think the steward is a major upgrade. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they held dances, uh, played basketball, and held concerts there. Uh, it was an unheated building, so it had some problems with attendance for that. And then for almost 90 years, um, the Boulder County Fair was held at Roosevelt Park, and here's one of the fair barns, um, and you can see the driving track, rain, uh, racetrack there. I thought it was interesting that you noted in the book that the Boulder County Fair was originally in Boulder, Correct. but then they kind of dropped the, the agriculture part of it, which seems very Boulder <laughs> to me, and so uh, we, took it, we took it from them, um, which is kind of interesting, and this was back in, 19 yeah when was 20s that or something uh, you know i didn't Teens? i didn't jot yeah it was yeah. it was in the in the early days and yeah and the boulder county fair was the first state fair in colorado so that was a big deal and yeah to lose it or at lose most of it i think they still had some things down in boulder but it moved more and more into longmont but over the years the um there became a lot of problems with it here in town so 
Uh, there was growing animosity between the city and the county fair board. Um, during the last years of the fair at this location, uh, quite a lot of extra work fell to the parks department as a result of the fair. And I've got another slide here. Here we go. And so, they were like, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not oh, fair, just, no. That's all right. So retired park superintendent Gene Cranning uh, told me that during the two-week fair each year, the park staff would move out of their offices and the pigs and chickens and bunnies would move into their offices. Lord, help me think that. Um, and then um, after the fair was over, the staff and volunteers would resaw the field, which is what you see in this picture. Um, two weeks after that, Longmont High School football season would start, which was played at the park. This was before Everly Montgomery Field was built. And since the sod was not rooted in very well after just two weeks before they started playing on it, they'd have to resod it again after football season ended. So that's an awful lot of work for a two-week event. Um, I'm going to switch on to the Rose Garden because this is one part of the park that is still one of the most loved features of the park, the Longmont Memorial Rose Garden, and it was spearheaded by this man, Theodore Shea, Shai, I think is how you pronounce his name, started in 1946 by the Noon Lions Club, and Shai was the president of that club, and uh, another fellow in the group were, were both very strong advocates of developing this uh, rose garden. Now, Shai was very connected to the park because he was married to Florence Mumford, and if you recognize that name, she was the daughter of J.M. Mumford, who had um, owned the park and bought it from that tax sale. Um, so anyway, the rose garden was um, known throughout Colorado for many years, and, and for many years it was an all-American rose selection display garden and also a member test garden. And there was only two member test gardens for many years, the Denver Botanic Gardens being the only other one. So very, very famous um, uh, rose garden here. And then although the name still remains as Roosevelt Park, in 1998 a new master plan was developed um, and the ball fields that were there for many years were removed to create a multi-use event space. Um, the master plan includes several historic references, including, as you can see in this picture of uh, Roosevelt Park, that loop trail around the park is a reference to the driving park days. So, yeah, so that's Roosevelt Park. Hmm. And then we move on to the next uh, section of the book, which is dedicated to... This is uh, basically the, uh, I dubbed it the form follows function area. It's really basically the mid-century. And this was also a big time of change. This was post-war and, of course, the baby booms. Those of us in that age group, we all came on the scene in a very quick, quick uh, rapid time. So with that became a huge um, push for new schools, new houses, and parks. Uh, so people were behind the gun on trying to get these things out there so they were done quickly and on very minimal budgets. So pretty minimal basic parks, but still really popular. Uh, sport, uh, team sports were kind of the big the big sought after amenities and playgrounds um, in right. those parks. So, uh, all those little, all those little baby boomers. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah, with the with the uh, form follows function, um, Kanemoto Park is one of the first um, parks in that era. Let me progress on, and this is the Kanemoto family. Um, they're a longtime Longmont family, uh, Goroku. Kanemoto came from Hiroshima, Japan in 1908, first by boat, then he took a train across the country and came to Denver where he got a job on the railroads. Um, he really wanted to farm, so he went up to LaSalle area and leased a farm up there. And then he uh, married, and his wife, Sitsuno, also from Hiroshima, uh, were married and they started their family. They had three children. 
And we're probably most familiar with Jimmy and George, um, but daughter Faith was certainly a big part of the family as well. Um, uh, the family owned a farm stand on South Main Street, and their acreage um, quickly grew to 350 acres here in town. But um, Goroku was killed at a young age of 51, so the children had to leave school and help with the farm. So that was a really tragic time for them. When um, the FAA came to Longmont in 1962, it, it really made the housing shortage very obvious. So Jimmy and his brother George became developers. Mm -hmm. and, but these were kind of the exemplary developers that I think we all look up to. Um, they made significant contributions to Longmont with the land they developed, not only for Kanemoto Park, but also for Burlington Elementary School next door, for uh, the Buddhist Temple on South Main Street, the St. Vrain Valley School District Administration offices on Pratt Parkway, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, a fire station, and also the first section of the St. Rain Greenway. So they gave and gave and gave, and, and I just, I, I admire this family so and, much. And the family still, you know, members of the family still live here and continue Absolutely. to contribute to the yeah. community. It's really yeah. an incredible family. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they deserve every bit of recognition and respect that we can give them. Um, the park was built along with Lou Miller and Lanyon in 1970, so there was a 45-year lull in park development after Sunset and Price Parks were built back in the 1920s. So there was these three parks, again, the demand was high, um, and all three were designed and built by city employees. Um, in 1972, the family, I've got another picture here, yep, they built the uh, Tower of Compassion, a 60-foot tall pagoda in the traditional style. And uh, at that time, there was, it was one of only two pagodas in the US. Um, the each level of the tower uh, symbol symbolizes a different attribute of something that we should aspire towards, including love and empathy. And if you go to, along Missouri Avenue, right across from the pagoda, you'll see a plaque there that really e explains the details of what each of the levels symbolize. Can I read the, the other levels? Absolutely. Uh, the third, so it's love, empathy, understanding that mankind is all one, gratitude of all things, and giving selflessly of oneself. And that, I mean, that family really embodied that. I think so, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so Kanemoto Park is certainly one of my favorites, and I think it's just so picturesque. Of course, it was hit very hard by the flood of 2013. We lost the wading pool. Um, to move the wading pool further from the creek banks, the playground had to be rebuilt, which was due anyway. Um, and then we um, dovetailed the refurbishing of the pagoda in that same project or in the same time period anyway. So, um, so right now it's, all, it's like a brand new park. It's beautiful. And I, I love the story about the damage, uh, the, about the graffiti on the, on the pagoda <laughs> and how the, when the emperor of Japan visited Longmont, believe it or not, this did happen, mm -hmm. um, the parks parks staff uh, went and repainted it, and then it was tagged again. So they immediately that morning had to get back out there early in the morning and repaint the thing, and then hid in the bushes when the emperor was there with with their paint <laughs> with cans. With their paint cans, isn't that yeah. a great story? I love that story. <laughs> that that is dedication, and and I yeah. think that attitude is still present. And then today. on that trip, he he awarded uh, Jimmy Cam Kanemoto with a. Um, a, a really high honor, I believe, right? Yes, that's yeah. right. The uh, Rising Sun, I believe, um, uh, awarded the Rising Sun or something like that. But yeah, he, he was recognized, and certainly for the good works he's done to foster relations between Japan and the U.S. I, I want to go back to the tower because um, uh, the Kanemoto family paid for that, they designed and built it, and then donated it to the city. And it was a symbol of gratitude 
for the, to the citizens of Longmont for their treatment during World War II. You know, this was the time of internment camps and um, anti-Japanese sentiment. And um, both we had a governor, Ralph Carr, who refused to intern any of Colorado Japanese Americans. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and then certainly Longmont embraced their Japanese American citizens as well. So, so they, they gave back by donating this, this Tower of Compassion. Good on you, Colorado. I, didn't, I had no idea that that was the case. That's... Yeah, Carr Car only lasted to that term. He didn't get mm. reelected oh. because of it, so it's kind of sad, but yeah. But mm. I think history will prove him right. Right. So um, move to the next millennium, the new millennium. And now this next park, I think, is, is, is particularly uh, special to you. It is. Isn't it? Yes, yes. So the, the, I, I've dubbed this section of, of parks the new millennium because basically it's, it's right coming up on uh, year 2000. So it started in the 1990s and um, a whole new pro level of prosperity. Um, we finally had an actual fee that reflected um, true costs of developing a park. So we had a little more money in the bank to, to build a proper park. Um, and also, there was a lot of immigration and migration um, across the country, so people were looking for better job opportunities and places where there was better quality of life. So Longmont became one of those destinations. Um, and when they brought, when they came here, they brought ideas that they'd seen throughout the world, in fact. And, and there was a receptive audience and support from the city to try some of those things. So. So it was really a creative time, a lot more creativity. And, and we also, um, other than this first park, which was my first park I worked on when I first started with the city. Um, let's see. Can you bring the slides bring back up? Yeah, okay, here's, here's uh, Flanders, Frederick Walter Flanders. Um, but I thought idealistic that I was at that time that I could design and oversee the construction all by myself. Well, I soon found out that that was a rather large job. So, uh, so that was the last one I did, did like that. But Flanders uh, is a very interesting man. Frederick Walter Flanders, he came to Longmont in 1904 and was a founder of one of our earliest banks. Uh, when he retired from banking, he became a realtor and founded Longmont Realty Company. He was well-known and well-respected businessman. He also served on city council, and for one term, he was mayor. And how that happened is, is the first story that is, I think, very interesting part of Indeed. our history. Yeah. Um, so some know about the early years of Longmont. Longmont, like many communities throughout the country, were controlled by the Ku Klux Klan. And they held their meetings here in town on a vacant lot at 3rd and Martin Streets. Uh, the Klan took over council in 1925. Um, and when they won that election, they celebrated with a parade down Main Street in full regalia and burned a huge cross at the end of the parade. Uh, well, their, their popularity was a bit short-lived because they fired a well-liked city engineer and a fire chief. And they also invested in a pork bell, barrel project, if I can bring up the slide here, called Chimney Rock Dam. And you can still find Chimney Rock, the remnants of Chimney Rock Dam up in the St. Rain Creek at Button Rock Preserve. Uh, its intent was good. It was to secure Longmont's water portfolio, but the project quickly outgrew its budget. After spending $100,000 on the project, they looked at the costs again, which their original estimate was $85,000, and the new estimate was $350,000. So Chimney Rock was abandoned. Uh, but we did The KKK get... wasn't very good at math, it turns out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds like... Fast tracks, maybe, no. Mm. Uh, but we did get something useful out of it. Uh, the cement was brought down from up in the mountains and um, used to pave Main Street and some sidewalks downtown. 
but in response to the Klan and this sort of uh, project type that they were so involved with, uh, citizens created what they called the Economy Party, and in 1927, they, they drafted Fred Flanders uh, to run for mayor. Um, Flanders and other non-KKK members were voted in, um, but Flanders refused any second term. He said, nope, I'm done, that's enough. Flanders was also very involved with our, to establish our first uh, Longmont Municipal Light and Power Company. And that also is a really cool story, I think. Um, Longmont first had a steam power plant, and of course it didn't take long before we outgrew that for our needs. So in 1892, the city signed a 20-year uh, lease agreement with Northern Colorado Power but people quickly became unhappy with that because they were limited on how many hours or minutes of the day they could use that power, and then the rates were constantly raising. They so could it, only have their lights on between six and eight or something like that, <laughs> something right? Something like that, yeah. yeah. So in 1911, they, they went to a vote and to create our own power company, which was successful, but Northern Colorado blockaded any attempts to buy out their infrastructure. So a citizen protest began in true Longmont spirit, where the residents turned off their electric lights and went back to kerosene lamps and candles. This was in 1925? This was in uh, 1911. Oh, 11, okay, yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, very spunky group of Longmonters at that time. Um, so by 1912, new power connections were made to our own light and power company, and each home was given a free porch light in, as a thank you for supporting this effort. Longmont was dubbed the City of Lights. The City of Lights, ladies and gentlemen. That's, yeah. I love that. We should, we should bring that back, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So um, the next park of this new millennium era I was gonna talk about was Sandstone Ranch. Um, and the park we know as Sandstone Ranch, that is the historic name for the property, and it pays tribute to these beautiful, hist uh, unique 60-foot high sandstone bluffs that are located on the property. It was homesteaded in 1860 by Morris Coffin, so before Longmont was even envisioned, um, Coffin uh, homesteaded this property. Coffin was born in New York, big family, 12 kids. At 23 years old, he left the family farm in Illinois for the gold rush. And he came out with three oxen, a wagon, $40 and a shotgun. Uh, he, he was skilled at whip sawing, and if, if you're not familiar with that term, it's basically taking a cut tree and turning it into lumber and in fact provided lumber for the first frame home in Boulder County. He never found gold, so in 1860 he came down the St. Vrain and claimed 160 acres um, on the St. Vrain Creek for his homestead. Um, he and another fellow, well, uh, Robert Houck, um, came to him looking for timber to build the first school. And this is the first uh, school district in Colorado Territory. It was called the Idaho Idaho Creek District, um, number one, and it was located at what, what is now known as County Line Road and just south of Highway 52. Um, Hauk was president of the school district and Coffin was the treasurer. And then in 1864, we turned the page to some very troubling times, and that was a time known as the Indian Wars. Um, so up, uprisings with the local tribes became a growing concern. So Morris and many other people of not only this community but the surrounding area joined what was called the 100-Day Reg Regiment under Colonel Shivington. So a dark chapter of Morris's life began with, with his participation in the Sand Creek Massacre. And that was where between 150 and 500 Indians, many women, children, and elderly, were slaughtered, even after signing a treaty giving them right to the land that they were on, and even after hoisting a white flag over their teepees, as was directed by the colonel, uh, uh, the commander of, of Fort Lyon. So even though this is a very difficult 
period to remember. I think it's really important for us to remember it. But things settled down. In 1865, he went back to Illinois and he married Julia Dunbar. Uh, here's Morris, actually. I've neglected to show you his picture. Such uh, a nice, it looks like he'd be such a nice guy, right? I mean, is, he, is he cross eyed? It looks also looks like he turn. may need to go to the bathroom. Well, this, was, this was before digital cameras, so they had to hold okay. very still right. and not smile. Um, but he married Julia Dunbar. And um, yeah, they, they look a little stern in these pictures. They returned to Morris's homestead and started their family, which eventually grew to five children. And Morris also had several brothers who came out to the area and several of them became very prominent in various other things. But Coffin was also known for the Coffin versus Left Hand Ditch Company lawsuit of 1882. So here's the story. He's farming along the St. Rain Creek for many years, and all of a sudden one year he sees that the, the flow of water is greatly diminished. So like every good settler back in those days, he and his brothers marched upstream. They found the brand new left-hand ditch diversion structure and they promptly tore it down. What would you do? <laughs> so of course they were promptly sued by the Left Hand Ditch Company, and it went back and forth at various courts and finally ended up in the Colorado Supreme Court, which the suit was found in favor of Left Hand Ditch Company. Um, this was the time when water rights were not really a thing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Left Hand Ditch Company got on the front edge of that and filed for the water right. Coffin said, hey, it's going right through my property. I don't need a water right to use my own water. So he didn't have one, which is why he lost. But this lawsuit is what established Western water law. Mm. So a mm -hmm. very big deal. Um, we we Longmonters uh, began purchasing this property back in 1998 from the uh, Bigelow family, uh, who really wanted uh, Longmont to uh, buy it because they didn't want it to go towards development, so they wanted to keep it intact. So, um, and I have to applaud the visionary um, thinking of city council at that time, who put the money together and and made that happen. It's a beautiful site. Yeah, it's yeah. also on the National Registry of Historic Places and is a Longmont um, landmark. So, big deal historically, huge wildlife, lots of wonderful things out there. Yeah, I've, I've taken the trail, you know, the Greenway, all the way out there mm -hmm. on my bike a few times. It's a great, yeah. great ride. Yeah. Yeah. And even in spite of the detours that you have to take now, um, mm -hmm. there's you can piece together down Left Hand Creek and then get on the St. Grain Trail and, and head out there. And it's a lovely ride. There's just an abundance of wildlife. Um, I was fortunate enough to have my office in the upstairs of the, what's the visitor center for six years while we built that oh, wow. and built the St. Rain Greenway Trail out there. So I have a very personal connection to it and just saw so many wonderful things, uh, eagles and hawks and wild turkeys and even mountain lion. Mm. So, yeah. Magical. It's a place. Mm -hmm. It's a magical, you, you take us on a magical Longmont journey through this book. Um, and this is just a little, we just gave you a little taste of it tonight. Um, there's a lot more in this, in this book to, to be revealed. Um, I, I, I'm really taken by, well, I'm taken by a number of things. Um, it, it's interesting to, you can kind of chart the development and the maturation of Longmont as a city mm -hmm. and a community uh, through these parks as well. In the approach, in, in, their, in the city's approach to developing and maintaining the parks, that kind of evolution kind of ref reflects the evolution of, of, of the city and the maturation of it and of it coming into its own as a kind of, uh, I don't know, mid-sized, yeah. where are we? A mid a small city. Well, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> yeah, some people say we're we're a big town. Yeah, we we're small, pretty big. Yeah, we're a big town or a small city. Yeah, I'd, how many, I'd go with that. How many parks do we have? Well, of these types of parks, so neighborhood and community parks that are talked about in this book, there's 31. Um, so yeah, that's a pretty sizable amount. 
I can imagine taking this book and uh, going on kind of a, a, a tour of, of parks, of sitting in each park and reading the chapter on that park that and, and learning about, about the park you're sitting in. I think that would be a, a really cool adventure. And I, th I think you've, you've been doing some, some bicycle tours that incorporate yeah. the parks, is that right? Yes, um, Lauren Greenfield has been working with me and she at one time was the uh, Art and Public Places coordinator. Right. So she talks a little bit about the art in those parks and I talk about what's in the book about the parks. And we haven't hit, um, tomorrow is our last one of that series. Uh, we haven't hit all of the parks. Again, that would be um, ambitious, uh, mm -hmm. but we've tried to make some really fun, uh, accessible rides for people and get out and enjoy them. And mostly along greenways are very, what she calls low stress roads, which I kind of like that term, that's nice. Low stress sounds good to me. Yeah. And that's what parks are all about. Unless you're playing some basketball, then things can get pretty heated. <laughs> um, if you're playing with me, that is. Um, I've taken the, I know that she's got some really great, we have some really great bicycle maps that the city has developed yes. or that Lauren has developed. And if you, that'll take, there's a big loop that you can kind of take around Longmont and it takes you through a lot of parks mm -hmm. and you get to see a mm -hmm. lot of our, our public spaces that way. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the, so the totality of the public spaces here in Longmont are community parks, uh, neighborhood parks, and then we have uh, like open space areas right. as well. How, can you talk just a little bit about those? Yeah, um, so yeah, um, boy, I think it was the early 90s. Oh, sorry, Dan Wolford, I don't remember when the open space program started, but um, that was a big, uh, a big step for Longmont to get into the open space acquisition business. And that was really to uh, provide nature areas uh, for people to get out. Dickens Farm Park is our newest nature area, uh, but there's several buffer areas around Longmont and agricultural lands to preserve those. So that's a huge program. And then um, greenways is another big part of our um, overall inventory of parks and open spaces. Um, and the greenways connect parks and schools and residences and shops and things like that. Uh, there's now an effort to try to connect greenways because our greenways run along all the water bodies and those pretty much run in a east, no, west to easterly direction from the mountains. So there's not a whole lot of north to south connections. So right. the city um, transportation department as well as uh, natural resources are working to enhance some bike lanes or some, you know, stronger and more pedestrian and bicycle friendly connections um, between those greenways and, and park sites. So how I could talk that? about this forever and I have a ton of questions, but we did, we did uh, tell our friends watching on Facebook that we'd get to some Q&A. So I'm eager to see if we have any questions on Facebook, because if we don't, I've got questions. Oh darn, it looks like we have questions. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Let's see, what do we have here? Oh boy, here we go. Uh, let's see, here we go. Okay. Someone says, congratulations on your book. Can't wait to see you tonight, mm. Ellen. Uh, let's see. Okay. Grew up in Longmont. Roosevelt was my playground growing up. Any comments on the Rose Garden history? Uh, we, we touched on that. We touched on that, yeah. I love the Rose Garden. I just, for the first time this year, signed up to be a volunteer at the Rose Garden. The Rose Garden is very heavily supported by volunteers to deadhead and prune and things like that. So I know they're always looking for volunteers, not only for that, but um, there's several other things that you can get involved with if, if you're interested in that. I'm, I'm from Pasadena, home of the uh, Rose Parade, so roses ah, play, have played yeah. a big part in my life. Um, are th okay, Richard, 
uh, on Facebook wants to know, are there any new big park projects planned for the future? Yes. Yes, actually, um, actively in design right now. Steve Ransweiler um, and Kathy Crone are the two main people doing new park development, and Steve really for the new parks. Kathy was hired to do a lot of the uh, renovation on existing parks, and so some of the fabulous new playgrounds, especially that you see in, in those existing parks are, are Kathy's. But Steve's been working very heavily on a couple of new parks. Uh, one really close to the museum location here, it's just to the south and a little bit east, um, kind of by the new um, St. Vrain School Technology Center. Oh, the Innovation Center. Center. Yeah, the Innovation yeah. Center. It's kind of in that neighborhood, a little bit south of there. Okay. But that will be one that'll be built soon. And then there's another one in southwestern Longmont um, that is in design, so that will also be coming on soon. And there's several more further down the road, so keep your eyes. And I really want to encourage people to continue their um, their diligence in, in trying to stay in touch with park development because those ideas really help make help shape that park into something really unique and memorable. And then there's a park naming process, which uh, you know these names didn't come out of thin air. They were um, it's the park naming process is designed to honor people or um, things, you know, natural attributes of the site, historic things. So you know, just wealth of things that can be honored through that naming process. So being involved with that, I think, is a great thing. And how can someone, how can one get involved in that? In well, um, they always, all the public meetings, and there's usually several for each park design, um, will widely post that in all the media sources that they can. And I believe on both of those parks, we're past the design phase, so now they're getting into construction drawings and making it so that the, the contractor can actually build it from not just a pretty picture, but all the specifics. Right. Uh, Connie wants to know, hasn't Longmont been awarded for the redevelopment of the St. Vrain Greenway after the 2013 floods? Has it been honored? Honored. Honored. Awarded. Awarded. Well, did we, rece did we receive a, an award for the St. Vrain Greenway? You know, in part, um, there was an award for uh, Dickens Farm Park. Mm, okay. And right. yeah, that and they got a big award for that. I, it's slipping my mind what that award is called, but well deserved. It's it's a very creative park, um, and certainly the St. Rain goes right through the heart of that park. So that's very cool. Um, yeah, I I think there's been certainly a lot of work on rebuilding the St. Rain, and and they're doing a heck of a good job, if, in my opinion. So I can't wait to see what it looks like. You know, ten years from now. Yeah. It's going to be phenomenal. Right. Do you have a favorite park? Do I have a favorite park? So you're asking me what, what my favorite First, child is? I want to know what your favorite park in <laughs> Longmont is, and then I want to know what your favorite park of all time is, okay. if it for some reason is not in Longmont. Well, um, gosh, boy, uh, anywhere, huh? Okay. Uh, Longmont, you know, there's too many, and they're too all many. so u unique and interesting. I think of the ones I worked on, the ones that really stand out in my memory are Sandstone Ranch, because it it's obviously just has such a wide array of attributes physically and historically, and, and I just think the design is very creative and, and cool. Um, and Stephen Day Park is one of my favorite neighborhood parks. We didn't talk about that one tonight, but it's up in the northeastern quadrant of town near um, Fall River Elementary School, right next to Fall River Elementary School. And that one, so part of the new millennium era of parks is a lot of thematic design. And that park is, it was designed around a theme of a voyager. So you'll see berms that are like sunken ships, and then just also, and, and in fact, there's a really uh, wonderful Art and Public Places series of art pieces in that park, also on the Voyager theme. So um, landmarks and uh, Explorers Plaza and things like that. So that's a really fun park to go to. 
Someone wants to know if the other pagoda, the, 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 there were two pagodas, our pagoda was one of two was one at of the two. time. Was the other pagoda in Reading, Pennsylvania, he wants to know. I don't think so, and I haven't researched this. Actually, that's Kim Manage, our the director ah, of our museum, asking that. Okay, Excuse me. I believe it was in San Francisco. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I I can't say that absolutely as a fact. That's just my understanding that there was one in um, uh, Golden Gate Park back in the. Kim, we're going to put some people on that, and we will have an answer for you. <laughs> End of day Friday. I promise. Yeah. Um, any uh, questions from our uh, very small in-person audience? Yes, you in the front row. I wanted to hear about your favorite park. Oh, Scott uh, wants to hear what your favorite park is outside of Long Island. Outside of Long Island. Well, that really is a kicker. I don't know. Um, trying to think of some of the cool parks we've been to. Um, there is one, and I'm, I'm not remembering it, but, or the name of it, but it's up in Winnipeg, Canada. And um, it had one of the most amazing adventure playgrounds I'd ever seen. Um, and this was 10 years ago or so that I was up there. But, but that stands out, Winnipeg, um, really fun park. Um, kind of catching me cold here. There's just so many parks. You know, I, that's one of the things I love to do when we do travel is try to go visit the parks and, and uh, just see what, what cool ideas they've come up with. Certainly Europe has a whole lot of wonderful parks and unfortunately I've only seen most of those by photographs. Right. But soon I hope to go visit them in person. Um. Which park are we more, most likely to run into you in? In Longmont. In Longmont? Well, Collier Park is my neighborhood park. Okay. So that's right. closest to my home. Um, although now that I don't, no longer have dogs that I walk around that park, I don't go there quite as much as I used to. Um, you know, I, I visit the parks. I visit McIntosh, um, Dawson Park, and Flanders quite a lot because I like to paddle and I like to cycle. So I go up there quite, quite often for both of those activities. And then any of them are along the greenways I, I generally stop into. All right. So I, I get around. <laughs> and then I think this last question is the most appropriate, is a great one to end on, um, if I can find it again. Oh. When will we have a Fitzgerald Park? I mean, you, you can, he went and then, you know, to clarify, you can still be alive uh, for, to, you don't have to do it, you don't have to be uh, not with us anymore to have a park named after you, is that right? I have no idea. Okay. Soon. Soon, I hope. Um, thank you so much for all of the work you've put into all of the years, the blood, the sweat, the tears, and all the heart that you've put into making the, these parks what they are today. And it seems to me like the, the, the history of, um, of Longmont's Park, Longmont's Parks uh, continues to be written. The, there's mm -hmm. gonna need to be another book, somebody, if not you, Paula. Right, exactly. Um, this is volume one of Longmont Parks. And jot Parks. down that history, because boy, it gets hard to dig it out after a few years go by, so. Um, so thank you, Justin. I appreciate. I really appreciate the opportunity to come down here tonight and talk to you, and to the Longmont residents. Um, you know, just encourage you to go out and enjoy your parks, and understand that this really is our our common grounds, our our collective um, green spaces, and that we should all not only be proud of them, but also take care of them. Um, vandalism is way too rampant. So when you see trash out there when you see things happen make a call or pick it up so care for your parks care for our yeah. parks that's right we're the stewards yes all of us all of us long yeah. monteurs yes, yes. Um, this book is like i said is available for purchase on our website and at um, barbed wire books and the used book emporium mm -hmm. on both on main street yeah um Thanks again for joining us. Thank you all out there on Facebook and Comcast Cable and YouTube, et cetera, for joining us. Thank you, 
everyone. This is the end of our spring programming, so I want to thank everyone who's helped make us make these programs possible. Our tech crew, Longmont Public Media, uh, Scott Stewart, Scott Yoho, our photographer slash social media maestro, um, Aubrey uh, Presswitch, our intern who's soon to be leaving us for bigger and better uh, exciting things, and Jim Fladmark, our house manager and uh, event coordinator. Um, we will see you for summer concerts starting June 17th. Until then, take care and see you around Longmont's parks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>